on today's show. Yeah, I mean, the first is I try to get too far out of the sort of intellectual masturbation, hyper theoretical <laughs> yeah. frame for it. Yep. You know, you know, if I start talking about, oh well, you know, the nature of, you know, labor substitution by virtue of you know, powerful artificial intelligence, machine learning and robotics means that the next wave of labor substitution isn't going to just be labor that's manual and routine, but increasingly cognitive and non-routine. Yeah. Like yeah. people either end up asleep or in the fetal position. Yeah. Right. Voting for like your, I wonder how many listeners we just lost <laughs> just, exactly. while I, just while I was saying that sentence. Don't worry. This is a nerdy group. You're good. Five, four, three, two, one, one. Welcome everyone to today's show. We have a special treat today. We get to talk to an entrepreneur turned best-selling author turned candidate for governor of Maryland, Alec Ross. And on this conversation, we get to talk about what it is like to essentially go out and sort of try and communicate to the masses the craziness that is happening and will happen with the world of technology. Alec is a best-selling author of the book, The Industries of the Future, where he shares his insights into what's coming for us next. And he talks a lot about technologies that in some ways may scare people, may make people nervous about the future of genomics and big data. And, and I think what I loved about this conversation was, is, you know, he talks about the real questions people, people ask of, what should I study in college? What should I, I help prepare my kid for? What should we do to become more technically literate? And in fact, what he's looking at is how can Maryland, his hometown, Baltimore, where he's from, how can Baltimore embrace this future? What I enjoyed about the conversation is he talks to us about what it took for him to, to really become an expert in these multi-technologies and why he decided that writing a book was the way to share it. Uh, coming out of his work in the State Department as uh, the head of innovation, working under um, Hillary Clinton and the Obama administration, he had a lot of opportunities. He could have gone and started his next company, but instead he said, listen, I have a calling. I have a need to sort of share what uh, what is really the future of these technologies. And, and as he shares, it takes a lot to sort of dig deeply, be really thoughtful. He had to spend a lot of time researching uh, to really understand what the future holds for technology. And I think for anyone thinking about creating a book, a podcast about technology and about the future, it gave me some, some ideas about how to think about it, how to, how to understand that it's not about you know, painting a negative view or a positive view. It's about painting a view that we can understand, which is why I think his book has gone on to sell, uh, you know, so many copies. He, he shares it's been printed in 18 different languages and, and, and have impacted so many. Um, author, entrepreneur, and now candidate for governor of Maryland, Alec Ross. I am so thankful to have Alec Ross with us today. And, uh, and when we first met, it was just sort of a uh, soon to be author, Alec Ross. And now it's, you know, Governorial candidate, uh, Alec Ross. So, Life so, comes at you fast, man. Life fast, comes at you fast. Man. Boy, the last email was like, I remember it vividly. You're like, listen, I'm super busy. Let me get this book launch and we'll get back. And, and here we are. Now you're probably running around uh, 24-7. So uh, thanks for hanging out with me today. No, thank you. Look, it's a, it's a real treat for me. <laughs> I love it. So what does it feel like? I got to ask this question. You've been in the entrepreneurial trenches. You've been in government. And now you're in the political campaign. Tell me, like, compare the experience of the intensity of what it's like seeing those worlds to being a candidate in, in a sort of a major elected office like this. It's intense. I mean, it's deeply personal. I guess one of the most disorienting things for me was, you know, I've always lived my life in teams, mm -hmm. you know, whether it was sports teams, whether it was, you know, organizational teams, like with my startup or then a campaign team, like when I was running tech policy for Obama's first campaign, uh, it was always it was always more we mm -hmm. than me. Mm -hmm. And the one disorienting thing about this campaign <laughs> is it's like a name, yeah. it's your name. Like yeah. they don't, you know. It's I am trying desperately for this to be more we than me, but it is different to sort of get out there with your name and your face, and it's intense. But not necessarily, not in an all bad way. Yeah. You know, at first it felt weird. <laughs> I felt, you know, it felt incredibly arrogant yeah, almost sure. to get out there and, you know, talk about yourself and, you know, your ideas. Me, 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 first right. person singular. But no, it's, 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 if you believe in what you're doing, which I do, yeah. 
it's intense, mm-hmm. but it feels good and it feels right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you, was there a surreal moment? I got to think like seeing your name on like a, a sign in someone's yard that you don't know has to feel like a little bit of like surreal. Is there been any sort of moments where you had to pinch yourself and be like, whoa, what just happened? You know, it's funny. You don't get used to people you've never heard of never met, um, <laughs> you know, ex- loudly expressing their support. Yeah. It's, it's humbling. It's moving. Yeah. Um, but you know, that is, it, it is similar though, to having written a book, mm-hmm. like my book, the industries of the future. When, as soon as I realized that people other than my family and friends were going to read the book <laughs> or people, th- you know, who I had professional connections to, like when I started reading reviews of the book or heard people talking about the book or publishing about it that it's a similar feeling it's it's validation without virtue of you know a personal connection and and it makes me feel like you know in the case of the book like i was writing things that were helping people figure out how to navigate the future and now in this political realm it's nice to provide a you know a little bit of light a little bit of hope where you know there's otherwise so much darkness. Yeah. Yeah. Now your start in a lot of ways came as an entrepreneur. It's, is it interesting at all to see, you know, I was reading some of the the press about you. Sometimes you're often described as author Alec Ross first. Is that sort of ever a little bit odd? Like, did you ever set out with that to sort of have that be the first descriptor of you? You know, I, I got to tell you, all of these feel a little odd to me because I do live mm-hmm. this very co- kind of holistic life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've been, I'm a former Obama administration right. official. I'm a former public school teacher. I'm a, I'm an author, you know, I, so I have done lots of different things and I don't know that I think any one thing really describes me. Um, yeah. But I do have to admit, like, I don't mind being described as an author um, <laughs> because, you know, there is, some permanence to a book. Yep. Like there is something about writing that is, that sort of it's, it goes beyond sort of our core, our, our day to day, our week to week, our month to month, our quarter to quarter mindset about things. So I actually don't mind it. Yeah. And I like it. And it's not like you just wrote a book though. I mean, you wrote a, a New York times bestseller. It was named book of the year by Tribeca film festival. So like, you know, you, you, you also wrote a damn good book. So that kind of doesn't, well, you're, doesn't nice hurt to say that. you're nice to say that you're nice to say that it just, you know, it just, one thing that's cool. It just got translated into its 18th language. Really? Um, yeah, so I love that it's not just an American book. Yeah, um, yeah. I like that I wrote it, you know, look, it's written from the perspective of an American, but it was written to sort of bring an intentionally global perspective, you know, mm-hmm. to talk about the forces shaping our future, not just in in the United States, but globally. And so mm-hmm. I do like that it's been global as well. It's funny going from sort of hyper global you know, writing the industries of the future to hyper local right. running for governor of Maryland. Yeah. You sort of flip things. In uh, like pancake feeds and fish fries. And uh, I mean, the right. get real, get your hands really yeah. dirty. And in Maryland, it's, it's like, it's, uh, it, it, it's crab feast. Yeah. And yeah. No, that's, that's right. I love it. I love it. That's right. You set out after, like, I want to kind of go back to the point when you decided to write this. You'd, you'd kind of been on this global adventure. And I want to I'm do a quick quote from the book where, you know, as part of your time in the Obama administration, you'd worked with Hillary Clinton and you said, you say in the book, I quote, uh, the time I spent gaining a global perspective on forces shaping our world helped me to understand exactly why life had grown so rough in my home in the hills and why life was getting so much better for most of the rest of the world. The world in which I grew up, the old industrial economy was radically transformed by the last wave of innovation. So you, you, you come out of this intense experience kind of being the, the forebearer of innovation globally, you know, America leading the way, and you come back and you, you, know, you have all these opportunities in front of you. Why did you decide to you know, maybe not go start a company, instead focus on a book? Why was the book the tool that you decided was going to be your, your, uh, your sort of next act? Because I thought that more than creating a new product, business product or process, what I really wanted was for people to understand that which was being built. I could have gone and built one more thing. Yeah. But I do think there's connective tissue. I think there's connective tissue between digitization, between 
um, the changes in labor economics mm, between yeah. what's going on in education. Like, I do think that the forces that are shaping our future technologically and scientifically have these cultural impacts. They have these, these economic impacts. They have developmental impacts. And I had never read a book that was accessible, like written for non-engineers. Right, right. That sort of tied it all together. You know, you could read a 300-page book about cybersecurity or a 300-page book about big data or a 300-page book about artificial intelligence and robotics or a 300-page book about, you know, what skills and attributes that t- do today's kids need in tomorrow's world. But there'd never been sort of a 250, 300-page book about all of those things mm-hmm. that shows the connective tissue between them. Mm-hmm. And so what I really wanted to do was take a really confusing world and help more people understand it. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that would help more people, Mm -hmm. that that would be a greater resource than starting another company. Starting another company is great. But what I really wanted was, you know, talking to these moms and dads who are trying to figure out what to do with the education of their 11 year old. Yeah. And saying, what do I do for the next five years? Right. You know, look, I had traveled the equivalent of 25 circumferences of the globe. (laughs) Two, that is, it's the equivalent of two round trips to the moon with a side trip to New Zealand. Oh God. Wow. Yeah. And just having seen what was, what was shaping things, um, I wanted to try to play a role of translator. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I wanted to. I wanted to play a role of translator. That's that's really it. That's what I thought would be would have the most lasting effect. Mm-hmm. And you you kind of you identified these sort of five ish themes or industries that would dominate. You mentioned a few of them: robotics, cybersecurity, genomics, data analysis, digital currency. So you know. Being in the the tech world, these are sort of buzzy things that we hear all the time. Now that you're sort of connecting this to you know real live Marylanders, real live people, what do you tell people that that are that sort of suburban parents with an eleven year old about these sorts of trends that they need to know? Because I, I think you've talked a few times about the divide that's coming out. How do you help them start to dive into some of these topics to see how it will affect their lives coming in the future? Yeah, I mean, the first is I try to get too far out of the sort of intellectual masturbation, hyper theoretical <laughs> yeah. frame for it. Yep. You know, you know, if I start talking about, oh, well, you know, the nature of, you know, labor substitution by virtue of, you know, powerful artificial intelligence, machine learning and robotics means that the next wave of labor substitution isn't going to just be labor that's manual and routine, but increasingly cognitive and non routine. Yeah, like yeah. people either end up asleep or in the fetal position yeah, right voting for like your, i wonder how many listeners we just lost <laughs> yeah, right. just exactly. while I, just while i was saying that sentence don't worry this is a nerdy group you're good yeah like so what i have to do is i have to ground things right and, and really make it concrete and in so doing then very quickly get to the okay this is what you do mm-hmm. um and you know for me for me that means a couple things. It means interdisciplinary learning. Mm-hmm. It means, you know, look, in a world where more of our world is shaped by zeros and ones, that which makes us more, most human grows increasingly important. And, mm-hmm. you know, so I do think that it's incredibly important to have a some background in things that are technical, um, whether it's scientific or technological. But I think that to the extent that that can married up with, be married up with domain expertise and what we associate with the humanities, then it really makes for not just people who can make a living in tomorrow's world, but people who can thrive and lead in that world. Yep. Yep. Uh, so a lot of what, when I'm talking to those parents, it often comes right down to, all right, what should your kids be studying? Right. Yeah. It's the exact question I was going to ask. I've got a three-year-old. Yep. What do we think about coming down the future? Yeah. So for that three-year-old, the first thing I would, I would say is, you know, make sure that she or he is multilingual, you know, look, Mm -hmm. our world is growing more global and, you know, the more good old fashioned ink stamps you have in your passport, the more (laughs) cultural competence you have, the more you're going to be, the better you're going to be able to navigate this really complicated world that we live in. You know how rough it is to fly with a three-year-old. You've got oh, kids, like murder. three-year-old. Uh, I mean, come murder. on now. You're telling me to go, go fly them to other places. I, I mean, I love. No, you. it's God. tough. But once you <laughs> land, once you land, yeah, it's good, right? Okay. Yeah. 
Once you yeah, land, it's true. okay. Um, and then, you know, look, I do think that computer code is the alphabet. Mm -hmm. Much of the future is going to be written in. So I do also think that in the same way in which, you know, we all grew up learning how to read and write and do arithmetic, so too do I think we need our young people to know how to code. Not because yeah. we want everybody to grow up to become a computer scientist, but because, first of all, it teaches you problem-solving skills. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I really do think that an understanding of the platforms that are going to be increasingly powerful in our world um, put you at a put you at an advantage. So yeah. I do think that you know if you can get your young people fluent in the alphabet of the future, which is computer code, then I think that that is that is entirely positive. I have a there's a student of mine um, named Matt Bussell who sort of you know espouse your beliefs i want to get in the technology ecosystem you know go, went to a good school at georgetown um was rejected from all of the big tech companies because of that he didn't have that technical literacy went out and, and wrote a book on augmented reality and how it impacts sports and just that ability to be able to understand and he's not a technical coder but i would say he's learned technical literacy to the way you're describing it i think that's one of the things that people oftentimes mistake is they're like you don't, we don't necessarily need to become a coder, but you need to be able to no. build, operate, and work and solve problems in a world when technology is at the backbone. And I think Matt now is working in the VR industry. And I think it's because he spent the time to really develop a depth of knowledge, maybe not how to code augmented reality apps, but to understand how to think about how businesses will be using them. Well, one thing that I do think is a shortcoming in a lot of technology companies is they so optimize for the best coders, yeah. and they should do that. Yeah. But the homogeneity of a lot of the workforces without having humanists, without having <laughs> people who have an understanding of emotional intelligence or behavioral psychology mm -hmm. uh, or these kinds of things is we end up getting, we, we oftentimes end up getting, I think, really clunky products mm -hmm. or get products that may appeal to, you know, the engineer, but not to, but not to a mass audience. Yeah. So I do think that those companies that actually, that oftentimes break through are those that have a much more diverse workforce yeah. uh, in terms of interest and aptitude. <laughs> you know, and you, what did they found out with that, uh, that false alarm of the, the, the bombing in, in Hawaii was basically due to poor user experience. <laughs> so you're right. Yeah, like right. We're going to need it in all these different places. Cause I, cause I think, you know, the, the, the point that I often tell people and, and, you know, I, I tell people every one of us, whether, whether you're technical or not needs to be able to be technically literate um, because you're going to have to operate in a world where we're, we're moving in that direction. And you, you talk in the first chapter of the book a little bit about what you saw in Japan with their aging population and, and robotics. Talk a little bit about what what was sort of the the both the positives and the the, the potential risks to um, the sort of the challenges with Japan's aging population. Yeah, so it's fascinating. So Japan has the world's longest living population. You know, the uh, women live on average uh, more than eighty years. Wow. Uh, men live to be on average about eighty. Hmm. Uh, what's interesting too, though, is they also have some of the world's most restrictive immigration policies. Hmm. Uh, and so there are literally not enough children and grandchildren to take care of the grandparents. Hmm. And it, just the math, right? Like in the United yeah. States, if you think about it, we have, you know, immigrant populations that provide a lot of this sort of low to modest, modest wage um, labor in this country. That is not the way that it is. Uh, that is not the way that it is in Japan. Uh, and so what's interesting is the robotics companies and, and oh, by the way, even the big car manufacturers like Honda and Toyota, which increasingly are becoming robotics companies, they've, they've created a home care assistants that are robotic. Wow. Uh, it's intense. Yeah. I mean, li literally robots that will lift, you know, grandma out of bed, mm -hmm. uh, put her in the bath, one that even plays the violin for entertainment. I mean, it is, it's like something out of a movie. Uh, and now, and look, I don't know how much of this will spread to the West. I mean, what's interesting is part of what enables this is culture. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the East, I mean, in the East, 
in, in our society, in Judeo-Christian societies, in our, you know, from in our mythology, uh, in our literature, we are taught uh, to fe- to not bring to life that which is an- inanimate. You know, whether it's Icarus and his waxed wings to to Frankenstein and everything in between, it's like do not breathe in life into that which is inherently lifeless. But Eastern societies don't have these beliefs. So in Japan, about 80% of the population uh, practices animism, which holds that every object, uh, every being, uh, every object has a soul. And so they don't have the cultural hangups about things like robots and robotics that we do. (laughs) So in the U.S., we would find it offensive, the idea that, you know, our grandparents are, are essentially being taken care of by by robots but they don't have those hang-ups uh hmm. in japan hmm. and you know look it's again it's it's promise and peril and yeah, all of this right that's right you know i do think that the idea of grant of, of older people aging with machines i mean there is something a little grim about that <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you've watched right? black, black mirror you know some of these things are like uh, anything that sort of seems interesting, there's also this sort of dark period that makes you cringe a little. That's right. That's right. And look, I don't look and with technology generally, I'm a little unusual in, in, in terms of people who write books about the future. Most people who write books about the future, they're either utopian or they're dystopian. It's yeah. either, oh, we're going to live to be 150 years old, happy, healthy, wealthy, and lacking for nothing. <laughs> or it's sort of fist clenched bed wedding yeah. dystopianism. Oh dear God! The world's going to end tomorrow. It's either Mad Max or it's Star Trek. Yeah, God, that, right? It's a, either Mad Max or Star Trek. And, I, and the God's honest truth is, I think that life is a little bit more up the middle. Yep. You know, all yep. of these changes they contribute to the promise of the future and they contribute to the peril of the future. Mm-hmm. And you know, what I would want to do as governor is maximize the pro- promise, minimize the peril. Mm-hmm. That's what's mo- most interesting to me. What have you what have you seen about I know there's been there's been sort of this push to try and think about job retain training in some of these locations. I there's a, a, a former student of mine who's doing um, coding boot camps aimed at job retraining uh, you know bus drivers in St. Louis to learn to code. What is the sort of what does it look like in Maryland as you see the shift in the way that we do that? And and I guess to that to that end, what is the so, sort of support functions that I think are or need to be put in place to enable that transition from sort of the old industrial age to the new digital age? Well, look, I think first we have to recognize that humans are not as easy to update as software. <laughs> you know, <laughs> look, you can't. Pl- My wife you would love pl- to do a hard reboot on me up sometimes. Right? Yeah. Like you cannot plug us into the wall, connect us to Wi Fi, and in an hour we're updated. Yeah. Like that ain't the way we're built. Yep. And all of the evidence is that. The older we grow, the more difficult it actually is for us to um, acquire new skills, for us to reinvent ourselves. And so I think you, you first you have to have an intellectually honest understanding of the art of the possible. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't take every, 50, every 52-year-old truck driver who's been driving a truck for 34 years and say, all right, we're going to teach you how to become a cybersecurity yep. systems analyst. Right. Like, it just doesn't, you know, <laughs> it, it'll, it'll work sometimes and it's inspiring, nice. but it's all, it, it's, it's not, not always going to work. The anecdotes the rule is, I think, probably, the, the, there, there certainly are those anecdotes, but it is, it's a bigger substantive thing that is going on. And and to your point it, that you write the book a little bit, it's got to start earlier too. You can't just sort of say, flip yeah. a switch and you now are going <laughs> to, like you said, you're going to be managing the systems for a, for a, you know, a fortune 100 bank. That's right. And, and I also think that, you know, a lot of people in my world, you know, coming out of technology entrepreneurship, they do think exclusively in terms of technology. They think in terms of software and coding and, you know, one of the things that I think we do need to recognize is that one of the places where there are lots of well-paying uh, jobs that don't require a university degree, which are accessible, uh, are in the skilled trades that aren't necessarily rooted in coding. You know, ours is a country with too few plumbers. Yeah. 
uh, yeah. we have, you know, we have a deficit of electricians. Yeah. I mean, find a master electrician. She or he is probably close to, you know, 60 years old. Um, so a lot of what that we're trying to retrain people to do, I think it, it's, I think we, we, are, we need to increasingly focus on really understanding what the interests and aptitudes are of the person who needs some skills adjustment. And then doing something within the art of what's possible mapped to where there will be job growth. Mm -hmm. So I do think that somebody who's been driving a truck for 32 years and is good at basic mechanics, um, look, maybe that person has skill, has the kind of skills that lend themselves to the business trade, bus to building trades and, you know, the plenty of $70,000 a year jobs that go with them, mm. as opposed to, you know, coding with the 23-year-olds. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's been interesting. I think there's been this sort of controversy a little bit around Mike Rowe, uh, the sort of dirty jobs guy, and, uh, I, you know, Baltimore guy, by the way. And, um, you know, I think, I think you're, you're exactly right. I think it was a talk that he gave saying, if you compare the U.S., job market and the number of people who go into the college market versus Germany, it's it's just wildly different how we think about the trade, so to speak, and um, and those career pipelines, which I think is a, you know, obviously we have connections to education, but it, it's an interesting thing that'll sort of have to shift over the coming coming decades. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So how did you, uh, the one of the things that we often see is that, you know, and I think we hear this a lot. If people say, hey, I want to work for myself one day, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to be in technology. Um, you, in some ways, with this book, I I'd almost like to say, you had to get smart enough to have, have co-founded a dozen different companies and sort of all the different industries you explored into. How did you get deep enough to have the depth to be able to thoughtfully write about that? What was the process that you go through to sort of discover you know, the, the trends, the issues? Because it, I think you're right. We said earlier, you probably could have co-founded a business in any one of these five or you know, more industries based on the knowledge you had. How did you do that in a way that was able to have such depth? You know, I, it was really a product of years and years and years and years of research. Um, you know, there was not a shortcut. Uh, <laughs> you know, I can't, I mean, I you couldn't I, plug your brain into the matrix. Oh, uh, right. Right. Um, look, it, it was, it was years of research. And then when I got a, a, to the work of sort of formally writing the book, I put a big research team underneath me mm -hmm. and, you know, not again, not to, speak ill of 22 year olds, but not the, not tw a bunch of 22 year olds, um, not a, not a bunch of 22 year olds. Um, but like the 29 year olds with graduate mm -hmm. degrees from Ivy league universities. Yeah. And, um, and cause I wanted there to be real rigor, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I made some fairly sweeping, uh, observations and it had some big pieces of synthesis, but I then wanted to test the degree to which I was right or I was wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, so that's exactly it. So it, it was a, a lot of work yeah. and um, it was a lot of work and <laughs> uh, a strong team behind me testing every assumption. Yeah. You're talking about challenging things. There's a there's a line that I, I highlighted that I laughed about because it's very good. Uh, these technical questions can a robot brush a person's teeth? And almost spiritual doubts can and should emotional connections be made between humans and robots are both valid. You're, you know, these the fact that the technology is so emerging, I think in some ways makes it you do have to sort of really think because you can't just sort of report on history. You're reporting on predictions into the future. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. No, you gotta you gotta bring a little bit of uh of, of rigor to things. You know what I'm saying? Yep. I totally do. I totally do. Um, you've got a busy schedule, so I want to make sure to, uh, to, to get you, get you on your way. But one thing that I would love to hear, one of the things that I think has been, uh, been interesting about Maryland, you know, sort of your, uh, your, your, your world that you've been deep in is this sort of investment in tech. And, and, um, you've seen that with Hopkins. You've seen that with folks like Chris, Chrissy Weichel. You've seen just this really in investment in sort of the future in technology. What do you see as sort of the advantages that Maryland has maybe over other parts of the country? And particularly as you think about building the, these sort of more and more tech infrastructures, tech ecosystems. Why is Maryland such an interesting place that companies are choosing? Well, first, the world's last trillion dollar industry was built out of computer code. The world's next trillion dollar industry is going to be built out of genetic code. 
<laughs> and Maryland is the white hot center of that. The yep. NIH, Johns Hopkins, um, you know, so the University of Maryland, like the world's most interesting work in genetics, I believe, is taking place in this state. So hmm. it ought to be the heart yeah. of the creation of the world's next trillion dollar industry. Another thing, cybersecurity. Yep. Um, the the two places where there's the single greatest concentration of cyber talent in the world is Tel Aviv and Fort Meade, Maryland. <laughs> um, you know, those guys at the NSA are badass. <laughs> you know? Thank God, and, all right. No. And so, look, I also, so, and there are about 600 cybersecurity companies in Maryland. Mm. So I also think that as cyber, as the weaponization of code becomes something increasingly consequential in our world, I think it's really interesting that um, we're at the white hot center of it. Mm -hmm. And so, look, you know, again, all, all these fields, cybersecurity, the commercialization of genomics, they all contribute to the promise and peril of, the, of our world. Mm -hmm. But we have sort of a front row seat for it um, here in Maryland. Yeah, it's uh, like you said, I think it, there is there's nuance, which is hard sometimes for people to grok. But I think it's also if you if you resort to rhetoric and don't think about the nuance that is involved in these technologies that are coming, you miss out um, on a lot of the real challenges that, that happen in these um, much bigger gray areas that people want to admit. Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And look, from a standpoint of governing, uh, I think that we need people who are fluent in these areas that so much innovation is taking place in yeah. and who bring an entrepreneurial mindset. And I think that instead of just having a bunch of lawyers decide our public policies for us, instead of a bunch of lawyers um, and career politicians governing us, I think we need to get some entrepreneurs in the mix too. Hell yeah. I'm cheers to right? that, my friend. I love it. I mean, it's, uh, I, I think you said it at the start. I think that the intensity of which you have, you've attacked the campaign, you've attacked governing before is, uh, I, I don't think there's any better way to sort of deal with ambiguity and uncertainty than, than there is starting a company. And, uh, you've done it from the, the two guys in a dog in a garage stage all the way up to a real business. So I give you a uh, mad props on that. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, we're, I'm so thankful to have you. I know it's been uh, it's been an adventure for us. I, I, it's funny to think it's been two years since we first started chatting and and how much things have changed. A best selling book, a, a run for governorship, and all of the uh, adventures that are ahead. And and I and I think you have said it, and I'm going to just re say it again and say it as a, as a, a friend and a fan. Uh, more entrepreneurs or people who've had that entrepreneurial adventure uh, should get involved in public service because I think there's something yes. that happens from it. And as much as it's terrifying and there's, it's easy to throw shots of who would want to be in politics, dear God, you need people who are solving big problems, corporate-wise, public-wise, all those sorts of things. And so I give you big props and a uh, big fan and high five as a, one entrepreneur to an entrepreneur uh, doing good things. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, thanks for thanks again for the time. And uh, the the book is an incredible read. I do recommend you read it. You'll you'll both be terrified at times, and you'll be uh, inspired at times. It's uh, the industries of the future, uh, and and God, there, I, I couldn't even find like hardly any any negative reviews. So it turns out you've written something uh -huh. a lot of people love. And uh, and now author Alec Ross to Governor Alec Ross. Excited to have you today. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. You too, man. More soon. Yeah.